Amen. Well, why don't we pray first? Father, we just thank you now for this time we have to come together for you. We know, Father, as you said, when two or more are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst of them. And so we know you are right here in the midst of all of us here. First off, I humble myself before you, Father. We humble ourselves before you. We open ourselves up. We come expecting to receive from you. I ask you, Father, it would not be my words, but your words through me. I ask you, Father, now, may your message come through. May what you want spoken be spoken. I pray, Father, you would give us wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. I pray you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding, that we would know the hope of your calling, the riches of the glory of your inheritance and the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. We just thank you now for this time. We give you honor and glory. We thank you for not our will, but your will being done now here. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was, I was praying, I was asking God what he wanted me to speak on. And I just felt him tell me, it's time to talk about faith a little more. And we know we've all, we've all heard messages on faith. We all know things about faith, but there's always more to receive. We know the word of God is living and powerful. There's always something more. You can read the same scripture a thousand times. And that thousand and first time you look at it and go, I never saw that. That's amazing. So everyone turn your Bibles with me to Second Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. And going on here, yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. Knowing shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So Peter taught these things to them, and then he said, and one time's not enough, you need to keep growing, you need to keep refreshing yourself, building yourself in this. So today we're going to look at Mark 11, we're going to look at faith, we're going to look at just a couple of points in it. We're going to start here in verse 12. There's a couple of things I know God showed me, wanted me to share with you. So we're going to look at Jesus and the fig tree. Here, verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out from, Beth from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. But when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now jumping over here to verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I was looking at this, and I saw four clear points here talking about faith. For all of us to strengthen ourselves in faith, the first thing I saw, looking at verse 22, when, when Peter was marveling, saying, Look, the fig tree has withered away. The first thing he said, Have faith in God. The first aspect of faith, the most important aspect of faith, is having faith in God himself. That sounds like a no-duh, 
but it's something we have to remember. Faith is not, I'm going to ask God, and now I'm confident in my ability to do it. I'm not confident in myself. I'm not confident in my resources, my assets, whatever I have. Faith in God is saying, I'm trusting him. He's the one making this happen. It is not me. It is not my power, my ability. He's the one that does this. And it is always him. I remember when I first went down to Oklahoma about nine years ago. And I remember I had received... A lot of I'd received a nice amount of money from my godparents, and I thought, oh, perfect, this will cover everything I need for there. But then circumstance after circumstance happened, and that money basically disappeared. And by the time I got there, my whatever I had left went right into a security deposit for an apartment, and then the first month of rent, and all I had left was about 15 bucks. But then I still had tuition to pay. All I had was just enough to get the registration done, and that was it. And I said, I had nothing left. But I know he called me here because I know he said, I want you to go to Rama. So I said, okay, if you're the one that called me here, then you're the one that's going to have to make it happen. I believe it's going to be you. So I trusted in him. I gave him what I had left. I just leaned on him. I was just faithful. I showed up to church every service I could. I went to the orientation. And within a week, all of a sudden, I got a call to the admissions office. And they said, Somebody anonymously has decided to pay off your entire year, the whole thing. I have no idea to this day who did it, except oh, I guess I do. I know it was God who did it. All I said was, you called me here. It's your will. It means it's your bill as well, and I trust you're going to do it. And lo and behold, the whole year was paid off just like that. He was so faithful. I know. I'm going to turn over to Malachi chapter 3. Let's look at a couple of reasons why we can trust him, why we can trust he is going to be faithful to us. Verse 6 here, it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. You see here in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, God was already saying, I am faithful, I do not change. If I promised it, it's going to happen. There's no other way about it. And for let's go look at a New Testament example as well. Let's look over at Hebrews chapter 13 here. We see here in verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So under the Old Covenant, God said, I am the Lord, I do not change. He said he was faithful. And in the New Covenant, he says, that hasn't changed. I'm still the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you know if he's promised it to you, you know where it says, my God will supply all my needs. Where it says, by his stripes you were healed. He said it back then, over two millennia ago. It still applies today. It applied back then, it applied all the way to today. And it will apply way beyond all of us going to heaven as well. That word does not change. So we know we can trust in him. So the most important thing with faith, the first part of faith, have faith in him. Because we know he won't change, and we know that he will do what he says he will do. The second part of faith, let's go back to Mark 11. We're going to look at verse 23 and 24. The second part of faith is we have to speak. We have to use our mouths. Now notice here, I'm going to read it out again with a little bit of emphasis on some words, my, my emphasis included here. He says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. You notice he mentioned multiple times, when you say to this mountain, you believe what you say, you will have what you say. When you ask in prayer, we can't keep our mouths closed. Faith is not a wishful thinking. Faith is not a hope, not you going, I really hope I know. Or you're saying, I know God said it. I'm just going to keep thinking, yeah, this seems good. Yeah, all right. But never say a word. You have to use your mouth. Because your words, 
you speaking the word will change your life. It will change things. Life and death is in your tongue. Let's look over at Proverbs. Proverbs over here. Chapter 18, verse 21. It says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The things that you say over yourself, even casually, you gotta be, we have to be careful with our words, and I'm not talking about becoming word police to each other or ourselves. But still, we need to, if we start catching ourselves repeatedly saying things over ourselves, we need to be careful because we're building something out. You're speaking life over your body or you're speaking death over yourself. You're saying, man, I'm always sick. I feel sick as a dog always. It's just not getting better. Well, you're building that foundation now. You're building that out in your life. We got to be careful with our words because our confession has power. We can change our world through our confession. I know one example, and I've been given permission to tell the story. When my wife and I were trying to have our firstborn, we were having a hard time of it. We tried for months and months. We tried for years and years, and just nothing was happening. And every time we tried, we'd think, oh, it might be. And it looked like it was happening a couple times, and nothing would happen. And one time we thought it was, and we had a miscarriage. But we just started looking at the Word. We said, no, that's not, that's not what God said for us. That's not what God promised us. He said, the children are a blessing of the Lord. There are arrows in our quiver, and He will give us a full quiver. So Kia... She started looking at Abraham and Sarah, looking at the story of Samuel, seeing God brought life to the barren womb. God brought life, and he will do it for them. He will do it for us. And so she confessed every day, every day, I thank you, Father, we have a child. I thank you, Father, we have a child. And she kept that confession strong. And lo and behold now, almost three years old, jumping up and down in worship, we got our little one now because he was faithful. God is so good. He always is. Let's look back at Mark 11. The third thing I want to point out. Back here in 23. It says, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. So we know we have to have faith in God. We know we have to speak the word out. We know we have to keep that up as consistency, but we also have to stay consistent in our belief. We cannot doubt. Doubt is the antithesis of faith. Doubt will cancel your faith out. We cannot afford doubt. It will literally destroy your confession if you get into it. Let's look over at James chapter 1. He's very. God was very clear when it comes to this, there's a very big caution he gave us. Look at verse 6. He says, Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. If we start feeling doubt creeping up on us, we need to get back in the Word. We need to get the Word in front of our eyes. We need to be reading it again and again. Find Scripture that pertains to what you need. If it's healing, go look at Isaiah 53. Look at 1 Peter 2. If it's finances, look at Philippians. Look at 1 John, or 3 John, rather, sorry. 3 John, look at, look at the different Scriptures. Get them in front of your eyes. You feel the devil trying to bring doubt into your heart. Speak the Word. He hates it. Keep speaking the Word out. You say, no, devil, that's not right. He said, my God will supply all my needs. He said, I pray you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And you speak out the word again and again, because one, it drives him nuts, and it's fun to drive it into the devil's face. And we know he's already defeated. He's got no power over us. Jesus won that long ago. But we do that. We're also strengthening ourselves in our faith. You drive the doubt away. You keep your confession strong. We know you're speaking the word. You're trusting in God. You're having faith in him. You're believing him with no doubt in your heart. And let's look at 1 Thessalonians now. Chapter 5. It 
There's reasons that we don't have to doubt. There's reasons we can stay confident in him. Look at verse 24. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Notice he didn't have to add that second part, but he made sure it was as clear as possible. He who calls you is faithful. He is always faithful, and he will always do it. It means if he gave you the mandate on your life, whatever he's given, he's given something to everybody in their hearts. He is faithful, and he will make sure it comes to pass. So you trust in him. There's no reason to ever doubt. Let's look at Second Timothy verse, uh, chapter 2. rather. Let's look at more reinforcement. We know it says in the presence of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Let's look at Second Timothy 2 here. Let's look at, starting at verse 11, we'll do a couple of verses here. It says, This is a faithful saying, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Even no matter what we do, God can't change himself. It doesn't mean that we go off doing our own thing. It doesn't mean we go sinning and going, everything's going to be just fine. There's consequences to action, but God won't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not change on his side. His faithfulness never changes. He's the rock we can stand on. Even if men fail, even if anyone we know fail, God doesn't fail. That's why we have to have faith in God, not faith in others, not faith in ourselves, because we know we're not perfect. But he is. He's the only perfect one. And so we can trust in him. Now I know when, uh, going back to that story I told earlier about my wife, on her side, she was confessing every single day for her boy, Siggy. And she was keeping that confession strong. I didn't know about it at the time, actually. I found out later she was doing it on her own. We found out when we were trying to have our boy that there was an issue on my side making it more complicated, but I knew as well I had to keep the word in my heart. So even when the doctors would say things like, it's almost impossible, it's not going to happen, I said, no, God made it happen, and there's nothing impossible for him. So even though the doubt would try to creep in, I would say, it's not up to me. God is the one bringing us the child. It's not our power, it's his power. So I don't let, it was the point of, you feel the doubt come, and I'm like, it has nothing to do with me anymore. It is everything to do with him. So I kept on my side my confession strong as well. She was confessing, I was confessing, and when doubt came, it look at the word and say, he is faithful, he cannot deny himself. It doesn't matter anything else, because he will not change. And to this day, I thank him every day for that blessing he's given us. So we know, it says, have faith in God. We know we have to speak the word. We know we have to believe. We can't just speak flippant words. We can't speak empty words. We have to believe. We can't let doubt in. But also, we have to forgive. It says in verse 25, back in Mark 11, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. A lot of people like to look at, you know, verse 22, 23, 24 and go, yeah, praise God, that's awesome. But they like to kind of gloss over 25 and 26. The thing is, your faith, it says at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, we're not going to turn there. It says, now these three things stand, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Your faith works by love. And if you're holding unforgiveness in your heart, that's not love. You will cancel out your faith as well. If you don't keep that love in your heart, there's nothing worth holding on to like that. It'll keep you from the promises of God. It doesn't matter what anyone's done to you. God's forgiven us of so much more. None of us are perfect. That's fine. No, we don't expect anyone to be perfect. But if you start feeling that, you're starting to pray, and you're feeling kind of a hindrance, ask yourself, am I holding something against somebody? Is there something hindering my faith from moving forward? Have I not forgiven someone? Have I not forgiven myself? Let's look over here in Matthew 6. Starting verse 14. 
as we know, two or three witnesses. He says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We have to keep that up. We have to keep our love walk strong. We have to keep forgiveness. You feel it coming. You feel someone did something to you or something just making you mad. You go, it's not worth it. I forgive him. I give it to God. He's bigger. He'll deal with it his way. We trust him to do it. Let's look over at Colossians. Chapter 3. Starting at verse 12 here. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. There's nothing anyone has done that we can't forgive because we know God's forgiven us of so much more. No one here is perfect, I'm sure. Definitely not perfect. And God's forgiven me every time if I've made a mistake. And I go to him and I say, I'm so sorry. And he goes, it's okay. I already forgave you. It's already done. We can't let that unforgiveness hinder our faith. Actually, about, was it uh, four years ago or so, I was working down in Tulsa at a Walgreens. And we had a co-worker come in at the time. And I don't know what it was about her, but she just rubbed me the wrong way. And everything she did would just make me angrier and angrier. And it wasn't like she was even doing anything bad. It was just something in me was just starting to get bitter about her. And I just did not like her. And I'd start to pray. And I'd just feel a block. I'd try to ask God things. I just felt like something was wrong. And I'm like, okay, what is going on? He told me, you're holding unforgiveness against that woman. You need to forgive her. And I didn't know why I was, honestly. But there was just something about it that it was just making me so mad. And I was starting to keep unforgiveness in my heart. And he had to stop me right there and say, mm -mm, you don't go farther until you fix this. God doesn't let you keep going on forward on the path until you've corrected things. He's not going to let you skip a grade. He doesn't let you skip steps. You do it the order he says to do it in. And I hit that point where I said, okay, you're right. I'm sorry. So I forgave her. And I, I called, put her, called her aside also and asked her to forgive me because I knew I hadn't treated her right. And when I did that, she was thankful for that because she'd noticed and she said, you know, most people wouldn't do that. And she respected that as well. It showed good character. It showed God's love as well to say, listen, I know I did wrong. Please forgive me. And so I forgave her. She forgave me. We did, we did great after that until she left the rest of the time she was there. Then I could move forward again, then I could pray, and I could feel God moving. I could feel God's anointing moving again. But I could not let that unforgiveness stop me. Because it, it was a direct block on my faith. Can't let that happen. But God, I just wanted to remind everyone today of these things. We look at faith just to grow ourselves even more. Remember, it's not us. It's not our power. It's all Him. Have faith in God. And with that faith in God, look at your mountain and speak and say, you have to move and be thrown away. Cast in the sea means it's gone forever. You're not seeing it again. You speak to that mountain and you keep speaking to that mountain and you don't stop. We don't get quiet even when we don't see anything happening immediately. We keep speaking. We don't doubt. We keep our belief strong. We trust in him because he's making it happen. And we check ourselves as well. Make sure our hearts are right. Make sure that in our faith, or walking in love. Father, I just wanted to give these moments to you right now. I spoke what you gave me to speak. I just pray, Father, now that what you want spoken would go in their hearts. I ask you, Father, anoint the word. Any chaff, Father, I pray you would blow away, but the wheat, let it stick. And may everyone here grow closer to you. May our relationship with you grow stronger. May our faith in you get more intimate. Help us, Father, to move on, not just to stay still, but to keep moving up with you, Father, to the next level, to a greater relationship with you. We give you honor. We give you praise. We exalt you right now. We thank you because you're so good. You are so good. You are so good.
You are so good. Thank you, Father.